Psalm 51. For the choir director, a Davidic psalm, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. Then I'll teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice or I'd give it. You're not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you'll not despise a broken and humbled heart. In your good pleasure, Cause Zion to prosper, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you'll delight in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. David's got a good life. Uh, He's the king of God's people. By God's kindness, he's risen from being the youngest of a number of boys to be king of God's people. His life's been hard. He's been a shepherd, a mercenary on the run, a soldier, constantly in war. But now enthroned by God as God's king over his people, he's just received a wonderful promise from God. God has said to David, I'm going to build a house for you. I'll make your descendants kings forever. One of your descendants will rule for eternity. In fact, he's going to be my very own son. Do you remember last week, Psalm Psalm 2 and the reading from 2 Samuel 7? David's king, David has rest from his enemies, David has security, David has a promise from God. I reckon David's got the good life, hasn't he? David's a shirker of responsibility. When he should be leading his people, he avoids his job. David is an adulterer. He seduces another man's wife. David is corrupt. He uses his power as king to attempt to cover his adultery. David is a murderer. He has the woman's husband killed. In all this, the woman is never named and David is clearly culpable. David thinks he can be God, doesn't he? He thinks he can decide right and wrong. He doubts whether God, despite all his experience, has his best interests at heart. And so David, in his attitude and action, says, I'm God, God's not, I know what's best. How can a man like that have the good life? Now, God knows what he's done. However, the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. 2 Samuel eleven twenty-seven. 27. God sends Nathan the prophet to confront David Nathan tells a beguiling little story. It's a great scene, isn't it? David then gets up on his high horse and in his righteousness declares that the man of the story should be put to death. And then Nathan utters those wonderful words. You are the man. How can a man like that have the good life? David is an adulterous, abdicating, corrupt, murderous, perverter of power. He's a sinner. How can a man like that have the good life? 
Now, David's sin is spectacular, isn't it? If you're thinking about sins, it's in the big sin category. If we're thinking about today's newspapers, it would be on every headline, wouldn't it? It would lead a current affair, the 7.30 report. It would never stay away from the front page for a matter of weeks. And let me say, there are some of us listening today who have something like that in their background. Others here today might not be like that. They might just be worn down by sin, maybe a besetting sin, a sin we return to time and time again, a sin that we nurture, a sin that we hold on to, a sin that in our own hearts defines us. You might not even be in that category, but let me tell you what we all are. We're all sinners, aren't we? How can we have the good life? God's people have returned from exile. They're diminished. They're dominated. They've been judged for their sin by God removing them from their land. And as they come back, they gather regularly, and I suspect they ask the same question. How can we sinners have the good life? And that's the question Psalm 51 answers. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Your word provides wonderful comfort, but it also has a sharp edge. Hebrews 4 reminds us that it's like a two-edged sword that cuts through bone and sinew and muscle to the very marrow of who we are. Father David experienced that as Nathan spoke to him. Your people experienced that as they gathered and sang this psalm together. We experience it today, Father, as we read it. Father, some of us might be struggling with a big sin. Some of us might be worn down by besetting sin. All of us are sinners, Father. Please use your word as a two-edged sword to expose our marrow, but bring us to your majesty. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that point two on the outline, uh, we need to get our bearings. This is something worth doing every time you open the book of Psalms, I reckon, uh, not just because it's a long book, but because it's a book that really speaks to our emotions. Uh, the book of Psalms in the middle of your Bibles in the Old Testament uh, is the hymn book of God's people. If you remember, it's been composed over their whole life, but it's been compiled after their return from exile, the moment when they were judged for rejecting God as God. At, at its heart, the key issue is the good life and how we find it. Uh, It's got an introduction, Psalms 1 and 2, which we've looked at the last two weeks. Uh, They state very clearly that the good life is found in the Lord's instruction, Psalm 1, and taking refuge in the Lord's King, Psalm 2. As we've seen over the last two weeks, the good life is found because Jesus is both of those Psalms, the Lord's instruction in the flesh and God's King on the throne. Many of the Psalms were composed by individuals. Not all of them, but many of them. Uh, Kind of like today's psalm. But they then become communal when it's compiled as a book. They've been written by individuals who are dealing with life. A a poem, a song, as they've dealt with their circumstances. And then as they've been compiled in a book, they now have a dual focus. We can say them as individuals, but we can sing them as a community. And Psalm 51 is one of those composed by an individual, a superscript there in the little type, that gives us the backdrop for how we're to understand this psalm. David, confronted by Nathan the prophet about his sin. But the final compilation allows us to sing it as a community. And we need to keep that dual focus in mind. You see, that's why it's so familiar to many of us. It's been sung by God's people over so many generations. Many of us have read it individually But in the history of God's people, as they've gathered time and time again, it's been the first psalm in the festival of Lent every year. It's the psalm that kicks off that period leading up to Easter where we think about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. It's a psalm that's really big on emotion. It's deep and it's dense. It's complex. You can see a man wrestling with what's going on inside him and what's been exposed. It's a psalm that's pretty simple to grasp on another level. Here's a man who needs help. 
Let me tell you, we're not going to cover all those bases today. Uh, In fact, uh, it would be great just to read this psalm every day this week to get its depth. On a simple level, it's 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 a three-part psalm. If you've got your Bibles there, you can have a look at it with me quickly. It's a psalm written by David who's in a mess and he's crying out to God for help. The first part of the psalm is verses 1 to 9. And you'll see that in verse 1 and verse 9, you have the word blot. They're kind of like a bookend. God, blot out my sin. Very hard to blot stuff out. This week I tried to blot out some ice cream on our tablecloth. I got rid of the ice cream, but there was still a stain there, wasn't there? And so David asked God to blot out his sin. The second part, verses 10 to 17, has the bookends of a heart and a spirit. You'll notice that in verse 10 and verse 17. And so David is not asking God to just blot out his sin, but to change his heart, to give him a whole new spirit, to to change his human nature. And then the last part, verses 18 to 19, which we're not going to deal with much today, looks at how this affects all the people of God and who they are. I think as God's people read this psalm as individuals and as a community, they're given a roadmap, a roadmap about dealing with their own mess as God's people, their own sin. And as God's people read this poem individually and communally, they're shown the answer to that question we've asked, how can a sinner have the good life? Now, we're going to follow that roadmap through five observations. You'll see them there on your outline. We're going to move through them fairly quickly and then try and bring it home to land. Uh, David's psalm begins with a personal plea. Look at verse 1. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. David's been caught, hasn't he? David's been caught. Caught in his sin, confronted by the damage. I know when I'm caught like that, I do one of two things. I offer a litany of excuses or I confess everything in this book list of things that I've done. David does neither, does he? Do you notice where David begins? He begins with the character of God. He doesn't begin with a list of his sins or a bunch of excuses. In fact, at no point in this poem does he do either, does he? He doesn't give a list of what he's done. And he doesn't offer any excuse. Instead, he begins with a plea based on God's character. He acknowledges God's grace. He pleads for God to shower his mercy upon me. Be gracious to me, God. He knows that God treats people in a way they don't deserve. I mean, just look at his own life. He's received what he didn't deserve, that God grants generously to those who bear his image when they only deserve judgment. Just read an account of David's life when he was a young shepherd boy, right through to his experience with Naboth and Abigail. Then look at what happens when in 2 Samuel 7 when he receives that promise from God. He knows that God deals in grace. He acknowledges God's faithful love. According to your faithful love, David himself has received that time and time again. David knows that God's people exist only because God is committed to them, relentlessly, faithfully loving them. Just look at the life of Abraham and what God did day after day with him. God, David knows that God does exactly as he promises because he's made a commitment in love. And David acknowledges God's abundant compassion, literally his motherly gentleness. David knows the generous gentleness of God, the way that God is kind in a way that humans struggle with. That's why David's king. That's why David has a promise about a house. That's why David's life has been preserved from Saul. That's why David has rest from his enemies because God has provided for him like a mother with a child. That's where David starts, the character of God. That's where he starts dealing with his sin, by coming to this God. At the very moment, he realises that he can't be God. That's the same for God's people as they stand there in that diminished temple. They've just been in exile. They've just known what God has done is right. And yet God's brought them back. 
God's returned them to the land. God's kept them alive. God's done exactly as he promised. And so it's the start of their plea as well, the character of God. And notice that when David meets the character of God, he doesn't dodge his own sin. On that point four on the outline, look at verses two to five. Wash away my guilt, cleanse me from my sin, for I'm conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Do you see how David describes his sin? He doesn't blame anyone, does he? Do you notice the personal pronoun he repeats again and again? My, 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 my. And three times he describes it in different ways. It's my sin. He knows he's followed in the footsteps of that first human being where he's decided that he knows better than God. And God doesn't have his best interests at heart. God hasn't given him a loving family, even though he has. David avoided his responsibility as king, even though God had made him the leader. David stole another man's wife, even though he was already married. David killed another man, even though he had no authority over life and death. David attempted to cover up his own sin by abusing his power, even though God had given him that power. Do you notice how David's playing God? That's his sin. That's all of David's. It's my guilt. He's culpable. He's not just caught. He's culpable. He's responsible for this. That's why in that account in 2 Samuel 11, we're constantly given his name. It's his sin. It's my rebellion. Do you know what? He's done just exactly as Psalm 2 talked about in verse 1. Even though he heard that psalm at his coronation, he's now joined him with the nations of the world to shake his fist at God, hasn't he? To think that he could be free of God. Instead, all he's done is create a mess in his rebellion. David has committed these actions against a number of people. But his sin is sin because it's committed against God. Did you notice that in his description there in verse 4? It's sin because he wants to be God. He's God's enemy through his sin. And so David comes to two very clear conclusions. Firstly, God is right to judge him. It's committed against God. David has wanted to take God's throne off God. David has assumed God's authority. David has assumed God's glory. David has said, I am God and so I'm going to do what I want. So God's right to judge him because it's committed against God. But notice, secondly, that he acknowledges that his sin is part of his nature. In verse 5, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. He's got two needs. He needs his judgment dealt with. And he needs his nature changed. He needs his judgment dealt with and he needs his nature changed. That was the case for God's people standing there in that temple as they sang this. That was the case for us. They've had their judgment, haven't they? But they've come back and they know that their nature is still to buck against God. The key issue with David's sin, with any sin, is that it is part of our nature. It is part of our humanity. Not only do we need our judgment dealt with, but we need new life. And so David turns to these in the next two areas. David deals with these twin issues as he lays out his solution. I look there in verses 6 to 9. I'm at point 5 on the outline. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. You teach me wisdom deep within Purify me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out my guilt. Blot, blot. David asks that in verses 1 and 9, doesn't he? In verse 7, David asks to be washed. In verse 7, David asks to be purified. In essence, David is using all that image that people talk about at church or the temple and say, God, Deal with the judgment of my sin. Give me a clean record. Give me a clean record. 
And God's people gathered had hoped the same, hadn't they? They'd done the crime, they'd done the time, they'd come back into the land after those years in exile and they'd give us a clean record. But as they stood there and as David wrote this poem, they knew that their record might be clean in God's mercy, but what about their hearts and spirits? What about their natures? What about their desires? They need to be changed. They don't just need God's intervention to wipe the record clean. They need God's intervention to give them a whole new life so that they don't fill up that clean record with the same sins. And so David needs God to change his nature. Map point six on the other. Look at verse 10. God, create a clean heart for me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. Then I'll teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Do you you hear what he asks for there? He wants a brand new nature. He seems to work in threes all the time. I hope you've noticed that. Three parts about God's character, three statements about his sin, uh, three aspects about what he's done. And now he asks for a complete change, a clean heart, a steadfast spirit, a willing spirit, a clean heart that desires what God desires, a steadfast spirit so that he doesn't waver, a willing spirit so that there is an enthusiasm to obey God, not to sin. He's pleading for a complete makeover from the inside out, not just to have his judgment dealt with, but his desire for sin dealt with. And at the heart of that is the key in verses 16 and 17. You don't want a sacrifice or I'd give it. You're not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you'll not despise a broken and humbled heart. David has the means to give unlimited sacrifices to God. After all, he's the king, he owns all the cattle. He has the ability to out-religion any person, David, the resources to do it. But if his heart is set on being God instead of God, no amount of action is going to change that, is it? No amount of religion is going to wipe it out. No amount of good deeds is going to give him a heart transplant. David needs to come before God with a heart broken because he tried to be God. David needs to come before God with a heart broken because he tried to be God. And that's the essence of his approach, a broken heart, not a proud heart. Not a heart that says, I can be God instead of God. No, a heart that knows the failure of his attempt to be God. A heart that acknowledges that he is an enemy of God, that God's right judgment on him sits heavily in his bones and that he's damaged those around him. He's been confronted by his sin, by Nathan. And did you notice in the account that we read from 2 Samuel that when that happened, what did David immediately do? He had a broken heart. I have sinned against the Lord. And did you notice what Nathan the prophet said to him in 2 Samuel? You are forgiven. David's life was a case study, wasn't it? His heart was broken because his attempt to be God had failed and had damaged. He knew that. He came before God like that. And his sin was wiped clean. And he was forgiven and given a new heart. The result? Well, notice that there's a result to this. In verses 12 to 15, I'm at point seven on the outline. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. Then... I'll teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praises. 
Do you notice again, he talks about three things. He'll teach sinners the truths, verse 13. He'll sing of God's righteousness, verse 14. He'll declare God's praises, verse 15. Do you notice what David doesn't try to do? He doesn't try to repay any debt with God because that's impossible. He doesn't seek to be a better person. After all, God's already transformed him. He doesn't endeavour to do more and be more religious. After all, God's done it all for him. David commits to something very simple. I'm going to tell people how great you are, God, and how they can be transformed by coming to you. How good that is. I want you to pause there and just if you've got your notes open or you've got your mind working, just think back through that roadmap that we've just looked at. There's a starting point. It's the nature of God. There's a recognition. Sin is who I am against God and it brings his judgment. There's a need. Judgment for my sin and my human nature transformed. There's a salvation, forgiveness, as God changes human nature, bringing the right spirit and the right heart to a broken spirit and a broken heart. And then there's a commitment to point people to God as the one who can deal with their sin. As God's people return to their land, They felt the judgment of God on their collective rebellion everywhere they looked. They felt the tug of their own hearts and aspirations to be God. They needed to sing this psalm to know that they could have the good life if they came broken before God, acknowledging that he is God and they are not. They were reminded of that time and time again, weren't they, whenever they gathered the cycle as they waited for God to do exactly as he so clearly desired, that the waiting as they waited for God to roll back sin completely and bring his approval again. And let me tell you that in that encounter between Nathan and David, we have the hint of how God will do that. Listen to 2 Samuel 12 verse 10. Now therefore, Nathan said, the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. God committed to this world through his promise to Abraham to roll back sin and bring blessing. God committed to this world to restore the right rule of God's king through the family of David. And now, in those words, in 2 Samuel 12, 10, God makes clear how that will happen. The sword of judgment will never leave the house of David. Because that's what happens, isn't it? It doesn't leave the house of David until the last descendant of David comes. Jesus. And the sword of all judgment falls on him, doesn't it? Do you notice how God hinted at that as Nathan spoke to David? As Jesus walked around, John the Baptist said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As Jesus spoke, he talked about coming to serve others in Mark 10.45. And Jesus made very clear that he would be enthroned as king by dying on the cross for his people. But he doesn't just take our judgment, does he? He actually makes us alive. Listen to Ephesians 2 verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the worldly age, according to the ruler of the atmospheric domain, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our own flesh and thoughts. By nature we were children under wrath as the others were also. But God, who is abundant in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. By grace you are saved. There's all of Psalm 51 in those verses. The character of God, the sin of David, his need for his judgment and his nature to be dealt with, God's mercy in bringing it to people who were dead and making them alive. David didn't need rescuing. David need resurrecting, didn't he? That's the same with us. We need God to not only deal with our judgment but to deal with our nature and he does it in the last descendant of David upon whom the sword of judgment falls. How could David have the good life as a sinner? 
Well, he threw himself upon the mercy of God, the character of God, pleading with God to remove his judgment for sin and to give him a new nature. How could any of God's people have that? Exactly the same way. How can we have the good life? Because the one who is Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 receives the judgment sword and so transforms us by taking our sins and making us alive. All we need do is come to him. So let me finish like this. We can have the good life as we dwell in the Lord's instruction and bring our sinful natures to God. There are four types of people listening to this sermon. There are some who don't even know that they sin, don't even know that they have a need, who think they have the good life and can be God instead of God. Let me plead with you, please listen to Psalm 51. Please listen to Psalm 51. There are some here who are dealing with big sins. Please read Psalm 51. In Jesus Christ, your sin can be wiped away and your nature can be completely and utterly changed. There are some here who are dealing with besetting sins that just seem to grind us down. Let me share a small personal story. I first met Psalm 51 at Coogee Beach at the Jungle Cafe. Our student minister in those days at Maroubra was Rod Chiswell. And I said to Rod at the age of 15, Rod, I'm struggling with this sin. Rod said to me, funny, Bernard, because I struggle with that sin too. We should have a coffee. So we went and had a coffee at Coogee Beach in the rain. And Rod said, have you ever read Psalm 51, Bernard? I said, I've never read it, Rod. Rod read it with me. And I don't think a week has gone past since then where I haven't read some part of Psalm 51. If you have a besetting sin that wears you down, please read Psalm 51. And know that if you come to Jesus, your judgment is paid and you are made new every day. There's a third group. Perhaps a fourth group, maybe they're all together. Perhaps there are some here who feel they are too far gone with their sin. Too evil, too dirty, too rebellious. Can you read Psalm 51, please? Because Jesus came for people like you to take all of the judgment for your sin to take all of your brokenness and make you whole, as Matthew 11 says, to say you are not too far gone because I have come to you. How can a sinner have the good life with a broken heart and a broken spirit clinging onto Jesus upon whom the sword of judgment has fallen so that our sin is paid for and our nature is made new? Please read Psalm 51. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Psalm 51 uh, is just magnificent uh, in the exposure of a human grappling with their sin. Father, please enable us to grapple with our sin like that, to do it knowing that in Jesus all of our sin is paid for by your mercy and love and compassion and that holding on to him, him holding on to us, uh, we can have our sins forgiven and our natures renewed. Father, please do that in us. Amen. Any questions? His. What is hyssop? A oh, good question, Chandra. I actually had that question this week. Hyssop is a little bushy tree in the Middle East. And they used to use the branches of it to spread around the blood of the sacrifice of the animals. And so it's an image taken. It's a great question. It's an image taken from the sacrificial system. And David's saying, God, make me clean, not just on the outside, but on the inside. So hyssop is a tree, and the branches were used like a paintbrush to spread the blood of the sacrifice around. Does that answer your question? Good question.